Welcome to Playing With Perspective, the suspended animation podcast, where we hear real stories from real people and we tackle all sorts of fun topics in the areas of business, marketing, entrepreneurship, mindset, the arts, and well, life itself. It's amazing what you'll pick up. Thanks for joining us. Welcome everyone, it's Darren Saul here, episode 204 of Playing With Perspective, the Suspended Animation Podcast. I'm speaking to Luke Hannon. How are you doing, Luke? Living the dream, Darren, Living mate. It is a dream. pleasure and a privilege. I'm happy to be number 204, to be honest. Uh, oh, not good. quite the double ton, but uh, yeah, 204 is not bad, not bad, mate. It's but great I'm, to be I'm here. very happy that you dressed up for me as well. I mean, look at that. He's totally suited and booted. Well, as a... Uh, as an event host, this is the studio garb. It feels weird being on a, uh, we won't use the word important, but let's use the word special Zoom call. And usually I'd have a suit and tie on. Uh, not many other times. I, when I host events, I've generally got a suit and tie on as well. I think there's an unspoken rule as an MC, you generally yep. plus one in terms of the dress code. But I don't know, I just feel comfortable. I spent a few decades in banking, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Yeah. And that all started with a suit and tie. So, uh, yeah. you know, actually, funny I feel you good should mention it. that. Let's, if someone once said to me, um, it was a photographer, a colleague that I did some work with, and we went up to a to do an event one night. And I just came in pants and a shirt, and he was in like a, a suit. And I said, What are you wearing? Like, I've never seen a photographer wear a suit. And he goes, You know what? One thing I've learned over the years is if you dress well, people treat you differently. And I, th- I said, Wow, that's a very good insight. It, there's the external treatment from the perception of others. And let's face it, first impressions count. And if I think it was Walter Bond that said it in his keynote, a ripper keynote, uh, if you've got time, go and watch it. I think it was the FFA convention. And he said the coach came in and he, he looked like success. He looked like money. Yeah. And I think it's important to dress in a manner that makes you feel comfortable. Now, me personally, I feel comfortable in a suit. I truly believe there's an element of others judging you based on the way you feel, but there's something about a tie around the neck as it is now that just makes me feel like, especially as an MC, because it's the only time I'll wear one now, it's showtime. It's kind of a bit of a routine, you know, like everyone's got their pregame routine. Rapper's got his water bottles and stuff. For me, when I strap the tie on, and it sounds a bit shallow, but when I'm dressed like this, it's 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 time to party. And and you are right. The external, the external views make a difference, especially when you're trying to make an impression. There's of course the other side to that equation, which is, uh, you know, what other people think of you is none of your business. Uh, and so don't let it stress you. But at the same time, if those people are your customers, well, it kind of does need to be your business because they are your business, right? I don't know. Interesting thoughts, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So it's really a combination of. Yeah. How society judges you by what you're wearing, but also how you feel. And they, they judge how you feel by what you're wearing. And that's a good point as well. Interesting. I think so. I, I think I, the reality is myself, all of us included, will tend to pass judgment very early on. And I mean, we'll talk about keynotes and speaking a lot, but I'd invite those watching to think about when the last time you saw a speaker present if they start by fumbling and mumbling and are we on, does this work? If they lose you in those first 10, 20 seconds of the prezzo, yep. your attention is gone. Yep, so true. And unless they do something really interesting or trigger, trigger your imagination or connect with you in a different way, it's very hard to win them back. Yep. And it is kind of the same for, for first impressions, unfortunately, uh, but that's kind of the way of the world. Now, my wife probably has a different opinion <laughs> because normally I'm wearing – my King G shorts with a pair of uh, <laughs> with a pair of work boots uh, and uh, and a, and a t shirt, right? And so we'll take the kids to swimming. She's like, Luke, you can't wear that. And I'm like, why? And she goes, because people are going to judge you. And I'm like, so <laughs> exactly. But I think there's a balance, right? So and I'm comfortable in those clothes, right? Like, do what makes you feel good. Everyone yeah. thinks I'm a tradie. Like, I've, I mean, I. I handle my own on the tool, but I'm by no means a tradie. Uh, but I don't mind dressing like one because uh, it's always an interesting conversation starter. Are you a painter? Uh, no, but I but I do paint. Um, <laughs> paint my numbers. That's what. That's what yeah. <laughs> paint my numbers. <laughs> Excellent. Well, anyway, that's a good place to kind of um, dive into today's discussion, really, which is King G's and work boots. King Off G's we go. And work boots. <laughs> 
Today's episode is all about speaking so that people listen and take note and take you seriously. Lessons yeah. from the lectern with the fantastic Luke Hannon. Now, I'll give everybody a little bit of a run and into Luke is just so we set a bit of a context here. So why do people not listen when we speak? I'm chatting to Luke Hannon, one of Australia's leading MCs and event hosts about his journey onto the stage, lessons over 400 events, how best to connect with an audience of any size, and why following your dreams is the path to success. And I'm sure we're going to be talking about all sorts of other things as well today. <laughs> so thanks for joining me again, Luke. Darren, my pleasure. I will say, as 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 an MC, it is really weird to be introduced. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever get used to that because as the MC, it's never about me or it's never about us. Right. Us being the collective MC community, it's not about us. It's about the clients, and we rarely, in fact, ever get introduced because usually it's, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening and welcome to the X event. Luke Hannon is my name, and it's a pleasure to be your MC. So I can see you've done this over 400 times. Yeah, that's right. It's funny, actually, we'll, we'll pivot slightly back. I'll come back to that because there's something happened during COVID, which was really weird. So when I get introduced, it it's just quite foreign, even though I'm clearly experienced in introducing others and over 400 events have introduced thousands of speakers. But hearing your own read out and... And more importantly, the why, which you sort of spoke about following your dreams and stuff, which is sort of what I focus on when I introduce speakers. It is uncanny. I won't say uncomfortable, but just feels like I should be the one doing it. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's a funny thing. So back to the COVID story. I noticed during COVID as, as an MC, and we'll talk about where it all began later on, but there was one event where in the studio I'm in now, the kids are clearly at home. Virtual events are going off. I turn into uh, turn up to the garage or the studio as it is. Studio is a fancy name for a garage. Yeah. And threw a tie, a jacket, uh, and, and a shirt on. And I just turned on. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good day. Welcome to. And it was almost this third-person experience where I was speaking and presenting, but I was kind of listening to myself going, well, that's weird because you've just switched that on. You've yeah. gone from casual father Luke with children to event MC Luke in the blink of an eye. And clearly the prep work had been done. So my scripting was there and stuff. I didn't rock up cold. The, the work had been done. But the ability to switch it on, yes, I'd never experienced before. And I think after that point, it was less about what I'm going to say and, and how this is going to work and more around being a craftsman where I'm like, I need to fit this piece of timber in this gap. How am I going to solve this problem? And that's kind of the approach to events. So it's funny that you brought that up because it was just a really weird transition from the way I guess I used to host, which was really sort of thinking about the moment and living in the moment. And I still live in the moment, but I can kind of do the hosting thing yeah, in a you're, way that you're I just a wasn't bit on able to autopilot do it. because you've done it. Yeah. So it's just yeah. Amazing. And make no mistake, no good MCs ever on autopilot because things always go wrong. I've had speakers fall through stages. I've had lights oh, go gosh. out. Uh, many things have happened. Okay. Yeah, funny story about the stage one. So I there's a great MC, probably the best conference MC in Australia, Andrew Klein, who's a bit of a mentor oh, of mine. But I know Andrew Klein well. I know him well. Andrew's amazing. And I reached out to him very early on when I was in banking, back in sort of 2017, 2018, when I kind of made the decision to turn pro. And, and Andrew was a lawyer for 20 years before he, he became a, a conference MC. And so I sent Andrew a message and I'm like, look, thanks for leading the way, you know, because you've made this transition. And he's been the most amazing character, just shared with me so much knowledge and inspiration and, and sort of guidance. And he told me a story once of how he, or another MC, his name's Darren Eisenberg. So Darren had a speaker for a state. Darren, <laughs> yeah, Darren told Andrew that. Andrew told me, and I've always wondered. And, and then when, obviously, because as an MC, if something goes wrong, you need to sort of address the elephant in the room. And so I was like, all right, well, if that ever happens, I'm going to do it. Sure enough, I'm at a conference and a speaker fell through a gap in the stage. And the line was, don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, it's just a stage they're going through. <laughs> and of course, the, the audience has a good laugh, 
But so when it happened, I obviously sorted out the problem. The speaker got back up. We got underway and it was all fine. And I sat back down and messaged Andrew straight away. Because clearly as an MC, you've got your run sheet. You've got to go, mate, you wouldn't believe what just happened. It just happened. It was the greatest thing ever. I love it. Uh, The next one is if someone ever trips over, and I haven't got to use this one yet, and I think this is one of Darren Eisenberg's. uh, If the speaker's on the floor, you can – our speaker will now be taking questions from the floor. So there's, (laughs) I guess there's always things you can do as as an event. Yeah. MC to uh, to to lighten the situation, and I think anyone who's chairing a meeting or running an event, and this is probably the first lesson for the lectern, lesson from the lectern, things are going to go wrong. Yes, speakers will be late, notes will get dropped, people will trip over, drinks technical, are going to get spilled, technical details, sound won't be working, lights will be, who knows, what. Oh, generators will go, whatever. Things are going to go wrong. Don't hide behind it. If address it because everyone in the room knows what just happened, you know what just happened. Address the elephant in the room and then move on. Now, clearly, there are some situations that are much more serious than others. If someone passes out, for example, ladies and gentlemen, we're just going to take a break for a moment. I'd invite you to talk amongst yourself. We're going to sort this out right now. Bang, I'm off stage. I've got the medics coming in and we're going to sort this problem now because it's really important. And if there's a significant emergency, ladies and gentlemen, we're bringing the event team in now or the team from the hotel. We're going to pay attention to them. They're going to give us the next direction. Because remember, when you're the MC, be it at your mate's wedding or you have to do it at work or you're volunteering or you start doing it professionally, the room is yours. You are the voice of that room. And you need to be a voice of calm if something goes wrong. And things will go wrong, serious or otherwise. And you're also the leader. People will be looking at you as the leader. That's right. That's right. Uh, probably lesson number two is when you're presenting and speaking, you are the shepherd, they are the sheep. That's right. Yeah. The, I mean, proverbially speaking, of course, yeah. but the audience will follow your lead. Yeah. And so it's very important that you direct them in a, in a manner that you want. Yeah. Quite often I'll have clients who want the audience to do something and they don't do it and the speaker gives up. No. If you want the audience to do something and they don't do it, stop do press. It. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, again. Yeah. And don't move on until they do it. Now, clearly, you need to be asking them to do something reasonable, <laughs> like not get your kid off. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you're asking for some sort of interaction or chat to the person next to you, take control. Yeah. It is your floor. Own it when you're up there. Own it when you're up there. Yeah, we love it. Well, mate, before we get on to more lessons, we've already gone through two, but tell us a bit about your story. How did you get into mm. this in the first place? I get asked that quite a bit for a number of reasons. Probably the key one is is... My background was banking and finance. So I've, I'd been in banking and finance for 22 years in total. But at the time I fell in love with hosting, it was about 17 years. And so you've, so had, that suit, you've had that suit for about 22 years, have you? <laughs> this one is actually quite old. And because it's a virtual studio, you can't smell how bad it is. <laughs> you can, you can, we haven't got smell of vision yet, right? So the suits and shirts can be as old as they like. No, this one's. Uh, I don't know how old this suit is. It's certainly not new and it's certainly not one I would wear to a live event, <laughs> but it looks fine virtually. Right. So uh, note to self as well. And I do have jeans on today because I've been out oh, uh, meeting it. clients and that. Funny thing on that, taking a slight diversion, in, in my virtual studio, which which I'm in now, I always wear shoes and clearly a shirt, and and and. but I can have my favorite King G shorts on we spoke about before. Okay. And I'll always have shoes on. There's something about being on camera not in a pair of shoes, which I think I don't like. And I, I, I believe when I sit and I coach people on how to sit in meetings, and if you're sitting in a boardroom, the way I believe you should sit is you've got one foot planted firmly on the floor. So sit on a chair, get comfortable. You plant both feet on the floor. So your feet are sort of at 90 degrees, your feet are on the floor. Then you pull one foot back slightly. So you're sort of on the ball of your foot. And I tuck the other one back. So I'm on my toes. And what that naturally does, it brings me forward slightly. Then, of course, you pull your shoulders back and that opens up your diaphragm and so on so you can can speak and project your voice better. But I can't do that without shoes on. And so I always have shoes on. Now, back to your original question around how I got into into hosting. So I'm in banking and finance. I'd always like public speaking and presenting. When I was at Citibank, I was on their management associate program, which is like an executive leadership program. Uh, And that's important for a few reasons. The first is that's when I realized I didn't want to be a bank CEO. It was there where I had two kids. My mum passed away at the time. And life kind of comes into perspective. And I mean, perspective is obviously in the title of of the podcast, right? Or suspended animation playing with perspective. 
I think my perspective was reshaped by those life events. Two young children and and a mum who was terminally with cancer, so it wasn't a surprise. Mum went oh, with yeah. ovarian cancer, actually. And it was there I realised I didn't want to be a CEO. But it was there also that I started doing a lot more public speaking and hosting events. And in fact, once I presented to the entire Citibank, a thousand Australian staff. Wow. And I'll always remember Viva Coburn's her name. She's a great leader. She's in Singapore now. She was my, she was the GM whose team I was in. And Viva said to me, because we were launching a, a staff referral program for mortgages. I mean, it's not important what it is, but the story is probably more vital. And so Viva said to me, look, do you want to do this? And I said, 100%, because I love public speaking. Most people clearly don't. And so there's a cold feet element. And Viva said, look, you can do it. I'll let you have the opportunity, but you can't pull out on the day. And I'm like, don't worry, I've got your back. Like, I'm fine. Like, <laughs> this is going to be amazing. So I wrote this speech and, and delivered it. And I'll, know, I'll always remember, I'll always remember Viva's face in the front row when I was delivering my speech. She was just like, because when you're speaking, you look at people, right? There's another lesson in there. When you're presenting in public speaking, make eye contact, look at someone, make a point, and then move on to the next person. Yeah. Don't look up the back over everyone's head or imagine everyone naked. Use that opportunity to connect with your audiences. And that's one of the things I see good speakers, and I do on the lectern. Sometimes the lights are so bright, you can't see anything. Yeah, I was just about to ask you, do you like the lights on or off when you present? Uh, in an event, I don't mind how bright they are or not. I think I'm quite used to it. LED lights work much better when you've got a, I've got two here, one on either side, a main and a fill light. Yep. They work much better if they've got a, uh, a filter on it because it softens it a bit. Yes. But I've been in events uh, at the casino at night with a thousand people where I couldn't see a thing. Right. The lights were so bright wow. and that's fine. Well, I don't mind at all. You just, just you're, talking still... to these, you're talking to this blank white sheet because you can't see anything. <laughs> yeah. And you have to be careful walking off stage because your irises or your pupils are so small from the light, you can't see anything, right? I mean, it's generally not that bad. Uh, and most studios have reasonable lighting. I think the Star City example, and there's been a few other venues where it was that bright, uh, where you, you, you can't see. Ironically, one of the problems that creates is looking at your notes, you need to make sure the lectern's well lit. Otherwise, you go from this brightness. As an MC, I always have notes. Yeah. My run sheet for a two-day conference, for example, is about 70 pages long, all custom-written introductions and stuff. But you can't see it. So you're trying to read. And, of course, reading three or four pages to an audience does require you to glance down and glance up. Yeah. Uh, pro tip, 16-point font size, one and, a half, uh, one and a half line spacing is what you need on your notes. There's nothing worse than coming with a, I don't know, with, 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 with an A4 page that looks something like that, like you're not going to be able to read that on stage. It's just not going to work. Have it spaced out. And that gives you time to engage with your audience, glance down, find where you're at without getting lost. And if that means that you need five pages instead of one, so be it. Make sure your pages are numbered in case you drop them so you can put them back in order quickly. I've done that before. Uh, when I was debating actually at high school in, in and we'll get on to how I became an MC. When I was debating at high school, I, I knocked the second speaker's cards off the table. I was the first speaker and they weren't numbered and there was like 20 cards. So you can imagine trying to put those back into order. So hot tip, number your pages, either your palm cards or your pages. You've got to do that. Good, good point. Yep, I like it. So I'm at City, and I realized I don't want to be a CEO. Okay, cool. So what's next? Well, let's follow the path of leadership at least because, you know, that pays better. So I follow the path of leadership. This is 2012, 13, 14. I leave City and go to Westpac. And then it's 2018. I'm managing a team of, of risk managers because my background is risk and analytics, yeah. which is weird for an MC, uh, which is why I get asked the question that you ask, how did you become an MC from a, like a data analyst? Uh, and my background was debt collections, uh, lending, and then risk management. Because once you've worked with customers in arrears and help them solve their problems, which is what collection's in. It sounds like baseball bats, but it's actually about listening and understanding. Yeah. Once you've done that and then you've lent money out, you kind of get the credit cycle. So risk management was a natural progression. Yeah. So anyway, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a risk manager. I've got a team of people. I go to this leadership course with a guy called Andy Fell. And Andy's now my coach. Yeah. And, and we, leadership for first-time leaders, it was called. And I know this because I'm kind of putting it all in a book. And it was the 8th of March, 2018. And I'm with Andy and we're working through leadership. And he comes up to me sort of towards, towards the end of the day. He goes, uh, and Andy's great at giving everyone attention, making them feel really special. So it was kind of my turn. He's like, Luke, uh, what are you doing in risk management, mate? <laughs> and it wasn't a condescending style question. It was more, you've got so much potential. 
why are you in risk? I can see so much energy and passion to do something else, but it doesn't look like it's congruent with what you're doing. And I honestly didn't have the answer why I was in risk. I mean, clearly I love what I did and I love my team and I liked banking and I'm very passionate about the banking industry. They truly do a lot of good things. Clearly there's a lot of room to move on some of the other stuff, but I believe that there's more good than bad. But I left there thinking, gee, you know, I don't know what I want to do next, but whatever it is, it's going to be awesome. And by this stage, I had an MBA because I went to UTS and got my MBA. Highly recommend that as well. MBAs are amazing. Less about the content, more about what you take from it. You don't, you don't go there for the piece of paper. You go there for the education. And it's the old cliche, right? It is the journey, not the destination. And if you really absorb yourself in anything you're doing, be it reading a book, tertiary study, secondary study, falling in love, whatever, enjoy the ride, right? Enjoy the ride. So it's now March 2018. I know I don't want to be in banking. I know whatever I'm going to do next is going to be awesome, but I don't know what that is. Then I'm doing a charity event for the San Felipe Children's Foundation at Westpac. And we've done it for three years. This was the third year. And I'm on stage and as clear as I'm speaking to you now, the thought came into my head, this is it. This is it. This is what I'm supposed to do in life, this being MC. And so I just went on this amazing journey. That weekend, I I built a website, got testimonials from everyone I'd worked for because I'd volunteered so much in the past. And then 400 events and five years later, here we are. But that's kind of how it started, right? It's And in hindsight, it all makes sense. I, I used to read children's books to my kids at night. We'd lie down and we'd do songs and stories. And I'd be like, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Like I'd be doing voiceovers and stuff, right? <laughs> And even going back to when I was eight years old, I played rugby league and played is a loose term for what I did. I kind of played in the dirt while the rest of the team played rugby league. I was hopeless. But the coach wrote in the yearbook and I found it the other day. It said, we knew when Luke's legs went as fast as his mouth, we had a great hooker on it because I talked all the time. I just would never shut up. Uh, So it's funny when you look back in hindsight, I've truly found my my icky guy, my passion. You know, it's nice. it's what I love doing. It's what I can get paid for. It's what the world needs, and and it adds a ton of value. I think is the four quadrants of the icky guy. I K I G A I. I highly recommend uh, have a look at it. It's uh, yeah. it's my passion. I'm I'm doing what I love for a living. It's just it's That's amazing. Awesome. And and what uh, kind of events do you host? All sorts, private, corporate, anything? Yeah, good question. I was very specific at the start, having done an MBA. There's a lot of models you learn in there around building a business. And I knew what I was very good at and where my competitive advantages were and where they weren't. So in my banking and finance career, I've presented to APRA, the the banking regulator, to ASIC, who most people are probably familiar with. I've presented to bank CEOs and boards and done that as an employee. Plus, I've got an MBA. Plus, at this time, I had almost 20 years in banking and finance. I mean, 17 at the time. I started 22 now. And so where does that set Luke up as a conference MC or as an MC in general? What sort of events is he going to be able to do that other people can't? So the first thing that was off the list was weddings. No. One, because I didn't want to work weekends. And two, because that background that we just spoke about doesn't give me a competitive advantage right. against an entertainer or someone who's just got a bunch of energy and is an amazing speaker. And okay. full power to them and all credit to them. But there's no difference between them and I when it comes to a wedding. However, from a corporate perspective, doing corporate events, be them finance or other industries, my background gives me an advantage because I can relate to the CEO of the organization. That's exactly right. And so I was very specific and said, right, I wanted, I started doing sporting events because I love triathlon, I love running, and they've all got commentators and conferences and business conferences. Uh, And there's a great book, and I love reading Dyson, James Dyson, the vacuum cleaner, he writes a book about invention. And he talks about the different iterations. And if you think back to the first Dyson, the DC-01, those big yellow things, you know, the handheld with the big wheels and stuff, this is in the 90s, right? And it was earlier in the UK, but in Australia, I think they got it in the late 90s. The DC-01 is just nothing like the V-14 they've got now, like a battery powered. It's a totally different concept. But he talks about in his book, just these evolutions that he went through on his journey from arguably, you know, the DC-01 all the way across to the uh, to the V14. Plus, of course, he now does hair dryers, air purifiers. They, they did a car, but didn't launch it. The point I'm trying to make is each one of us in life, in business, will tend to go through different evolutions. And that's okay. I feel that I'm on my DCO4 at the moment, my fourth evolution, 
The first was sporting events and conferences. So I went hard on those. And a funny story, actually. The first cold call I ever made said yes. Everyone has said no since then. Well, that's not true. Some people say yes. But literally the first time I picked up the phone, uh, a guy called Mark Roberts, who's still a, a good friend of mine, I still work for him, uh, from a company called Max Adventure. And they do running events, like trail running events uh, all across the Eastern Seaboard. They do great events and adventure races too. And Mark and Gary, who was one of the owners at the time, said, oh, yeah, mate, yeah, we really need a host. And I'm like, well, this is great, right? Because I've got bundles of energy. And I'm a trail runner and a triathlete myself, so I can relate to the to the to the crowd and can connect with them in a way again that another MC couldn't, because a lot of MCs don't do triathlons, they don't do trail runs, so they don't understand the gamut of emotions that you go through on an event that's 10, 12, 13, or even four or five hours long. Uh, but because I've got that understanding, I know how to connect with the the runners as they come past. I know what. I would want to hear in that particular situation what got my adrenaline charging or what gave me the hope or the, the willingness to go on. So that's DC01, running events and, and, and conferences. And that grew quite well. That's 2018 into 2019. 2019, my business is growing great. I'm doing plenty of events. And of course, the C-bomb arrives, right? Um, at, the start of, at, the start of 20, at the start of 2020. And then I pivoted online. So this is the second iteration of Luke's business where... Clients were like, well, we need a moderator for, for these sort of intimate virtual roundtables and virtual events. And of course, a business background, a, a speaker by trade, we got into that. And then COVID sort of finished and started again, but it finished and then we went live. Right. And so then we went to live lunches and back to live conferences again, still doing the occasional sporting event. But also I'd realized that sporting events is where Luke Hannon gets to be Luke Hannon. And I don't want to talk about myself in the third person, but... That's where I can just be completely energetic off the rails because I'm quite measured clearly in a conference <laughs> off the rails. And, and it's so spontaneous. It's so spontaneous. Like the other day, and I kid you not, I had at Max Adventure, there's a lot of couples that run husband and wife. The awkward thing is I see their name. It could be a father and daughter, right? I don't know. <laughs> and the age group comes up, but quite often the age groups are quite broad. So it could be a 20 year age gap between a father and a daughter or a husband and a wife. So I'd be like, Mr. and Mrs. Saul of coming in. And they're like, we're brother and sister. And it just gets really <laughs> awkward. Funny story from the other day, there was a man and a woman, absolute boy and a girl they were. They were like, oh, they were teenagers or adolescents, shall we say. Her name was Shade and his name was Sonny. <laughs> so Sonny and Shade were running together and it was the greatest and we had a ball. And so it's just those word plays. I've hosted the Sydney to Gong ride for, for the last five years. Yeah. And it's just... The amount of fun you can have with delegates, and it's completely respectful, or, or competitors in this case, it's completely respectful, but you bring them over the line, you recharge, and they have an amazing experience, and everyone wins, right? It's, it's, it's a great time. And now here we are in the fourth iteration of my business, where this year the growth is, again, in conferences, uh, and to a lesser extent, roundtables, because the industry is kind of changing. And I'm also doing a lot of coaching. And, and again, after 400 events, you learn a lot. I'm quite perceptive and try and continuously improve, which how it gets us onto lessons from the lectern, where I say, well, this is what I believe makes a great presentation. And there's certainly not a recipe, yep. but there's definitely a suite of ingredients. Yes. And you can mix those up any way you want, but or choose whichever ingredients you want. But I believe there's a pool of ingredients which tend to lean more to a successful presentation. And that's what the uh, that's what the training's based upon. So in terms of events, that's a bit of a roll through as to the life of Luke, but no, I've done two weddings and I'm not a wedding MC. They were both for friends where they said, hey, we need you to do our wedding. Uh, and I did that. And there are so many amazing wedding MCs out there. Jeremiah Hartman is a good mate of mine uh, and many others who are just, top shelf MCs nice. and they own that industry and they deserve to own it because I don't know how many weddings Jeremy has done, but it would be hundreds, if not thousands. So he's got his niche. I've got mine. And, and I think we just, we grow in our own spaces, you know? Awesome. Now, quick question before we get on to a lot of the lessons that you've learned, which I definitely want to delve into. Yeah. Why should people use a professional MC and not just use somebody Ooh. that's already, you know, part of the organization? Do, 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 do. It's the age old question. And it is a really important one. Now, there are times when someone that you know is going to be appropriate. Yeah. And this is another thing about weddings. Some weddings are quite casual. And your friend 
or best man who knows the family intimately, the family ins, the family outs, the jokes, yeah. and he can present reasonably well and is reasonably organized, he's probably going to provide on a balance of probabilities as much value as a professional MC in that particular instance. Gotcha. In that particular instance. So there are questions around what's better. Do we need our mate who's measured enough to run the event as we want? And of course there's intricacies at weddings as well, right? Like the MC needs to pull the bride and groom away to go and get photos at a particular time or use his instinct or her instinct, their instinct and experience to make sure that the bride and groom get the best outcome that they want. And every bride and groom is different. Some are very chilled out and don't want anything. Some want a very particular running order. And so depending on their needs and what they want, that's where a professional MC comes in. In a corporate sense, there's a real difference between someone who loves to hold the microphone and someone who knows how to hold the microphone. And clearly it's not just introducing speakers, but so many things go wrong at events. And so a good MC is going to know exactly what to do in most situations. The lights have gone out. Someone's fallen through the stage, which we sort of touched upon before coming on air, which happened to me. Running Uh, late, whatever. Running late. Speakers have been cancelled. I've delivered keynotes before, and I have two or three different keynotes that I'll deliver because speakers haven't turned up. And I'll get a message at the last minute, two minutes before they've had to go on stage, or they've turned up, they've been mic'd up, and the person's a chief information security officer, and their company's just been hacked. Oh. Well, well, he's got to go. So, so then you know? you've got to fill 15, 20 minutes. Luke, hand it over to you, sometimes longer, 30 or 45. Oh and so that's where the MC is going to have the solution to the problem. And any number of problems can go wrong. I did an event once where there was a blackout yeah. at an awards night, actually. It was in Terry Hills this year. And we were early on in the night and the lights went out, like completely. There was a huge storm, massive wind, beautiful venue, but it was dark. And as soon as the lights went out, I noticed that there was candles on every table. Uh-huh. Again, you've got to address the elephant in the room when something goes wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, there comes a time in everyone's life where we need to look into the eyes of the person sitting next to us <laughs> and just say, I love you. <laughs> Welcome to the romantic part of the evening where candlelit dinners are provided for all. It's over to you now to find someone you may never have met them, let you know you love them, and we'll be right back. No, now, right. that's literally what I said, and I guess that's the switch, right? You just turn that on. So I address the elephant in the room. There's clearly a blackout. Everyone in the room knows the power has gone out, and it wasn't supposed to. There's no hiding behind the fact of that. The value in the MC, back to your question, is quick thinking on their feet, bringing the audience on a quick journey, because in that case, something serious hadn't gone wrong. So it's okay, we can can deal with that. And then I'm straight out the back to work with the event team to go, right, when's the power coming back on? What are we going to do? Now, the power never came back on. The emergency generators did. The lights around the outside of the room did. So then I had to interview someone who's now a great friend of mine and We did that on stage, but I only had one microphone. So I gave him the microphone because I've got a big voice and then used my experience to say, well, having interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people, what he has to say is far more important than what I have to say. And that's what the audience came to hear. So I threw the questions out in my outside voice. He spoke. And then we had a great conversation for 45 minutes. Dinner was still able to be served, but it was late because they had to pivot to the gas ovens from the electrical ovens. And so then I knew that I could fill in or bring some awards forward or or make the changes. So that's a very particular example. But the difference between a professional MC and someone who was just holding the microphone is professional MCs are event profs, right? We're event professionals. They get events. They understand timing. They know when something happens. Because of their experience, they're they're ready ready to handle many different situations that might arise. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it needs to be the right type of event as well. You know, if you're having a Australia's greatest morning tea with half a dozen people, yeah. is it worth bringing a professional MC in or is that a great learning experience for someone in the team that wants to get it better at public speaking? That's probably better for them. So it depends on the event. Gotcha. But when there is a an event proper and you've invested time, money, and there's there's risk, like if something goes wrong, there's going to be reputational, monetary loss, the delegates are going to think less of you. I truly believe in the value of someone that knows what they're doing. And that generally is a professional event team and and a professional MC. Yeah. Fantastic. I never really thought of the risk element and that's Mm. probably the biggest one. Fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. What if something goes wrong? Yeah. What, 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 what then? And what, what sometimes isn't obvious is those things 
you can't measure on a P&L. And we found this a lot in banking as well. And in any business, really, it's very easy to measure an incremental expense on a P&L because, you know, your income was $100, P&L profit and loss statement. So, you know, at the top is your income. My income was 100 bucks. Simplified version, my expenses were 50, 100 minus 50, my profit is 50 bucks. If those expenses go up by $10 to $60, well, then I've still got $100 revenue. My expenses are now $60. My profit has gone down to $40. So it's easy to measure stuff like that on a P&L. But what you can't measure is how much did it cost because we did something that annoyed our staff and they left? Correct. Or your the customers. Lost, yeah, or customers left. Yeah. Or customers didn't deepen their relationship with us. Or they didn't come back. That's right. Those things are really hard to measure on, on a P&L and they, and they don't flow through. Just the same as risk is hard to measure at an event because, okay, you've spent X on the ICC, you know, and how much it costs is less relevant than the example. But you've invested, let's make these numbers up, right? You've invested $100,000 on a venue, right? Because it's a massive venue, it's a huge event. You've brought in $500,000 worth of sponsors. And then you bring in, 2,000 people who've either paid with time or paid with money or yeah. both. Yeah. How do you put a cost on annoying them so A, they don't come back, B, they tell their friends about what a bad experience it was, or C, if it was an internal event, how do you measure the cost of a day's worth of productivity because XYZ company just took 4,000 employees off the floor for a day? That's right. Like the daily rate of most people that the bank is paying would be at least 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. That's 200K in wages right there. Mm -hmm. And so they're investing all this money that you can see and that you can't see. And so investing in someone to run your event properly, noting that the MC is kind of your face of the event, is a massive investment. And of course, the opposite side of that is if it goes wrong, how much are you risking, right? Yeah. So yeah. Fascinating. What's the largest room you've ever mm -hmm. uh, hosted? The largest crowd... Would be about four and a half thousand. Wow. And that's at the finished side of the city to gong ride. But there's a bit of a caveat on that one is that at a sporting event, you don't really have their attention. I mean, you're speaking and some people are listening, but it's not yeah. four and a half thousand eyes locked on you. Yeah. Financial events, I host the FST Media Future of Finance Sydney event every year. Yeah. That brings in over 12 or 1300 delegates. And there you have the room. Yeah. You've got the room. And every MC has their own style, just on got the room. My style is is thought provoking. I try and leave the audience with something. I, I believe if someone or or a or a cohort of individuals is good enough to if they're good enough to bestow upon you a portion of their life, i.e. give you their attention, do something with it. Yeah. Make them think differently, make them take something away. Now there are amazing comedians out there, and if their job is to make people laugh, then they've done their job. Yeah. I'm not a comedian. I do crack jokes on stage, but they need to be appropriate and they're never in the script. So <laughs> another lesson is the risk reward ratio back on risk. And my background in finance is risk, right? Which is kind of all this makes sense. <laughs> the risk reward ratio of you cracking a joke at the start of your prezzo, you have to take it into account. And here's something about risk. Because in life, you can't generally get a reward without taking risk. Yeah. So you can't get a reward without taking risk but you can take risk for little or no reward. Right. And so you need to consider what is the risk of this joke? Because if it bombs, you have lost the audience. They are gone. They have checked out and it's going to be hard to get them back. But if there's a reward, then it might be worth it. So an example of a reward, I was coaching a, uh, a Scottish guy uh, at an event years ago about his kid who's very nervous and he had a very, very, very thick accent, really thick accent. And so he cracked a joke very early on about, I'm sorry, this is live. My speech doesn't come with subtitles, something like that, right? He cracked a joke about subtitles, yeah. but that did two important things. The first is it was a bit of an icebreaker, a bit of a joke, yeah, sure. But the reward was the audience was then on notice that I am going to be hard to understand. You need to pay attention. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, as it turns out, the audience had a good laugh and so he got the reward and it mitigated the risk of people not being able to understand him and it also didn't bomb. So there's a big one there on jokes. I'm not a big fan at all and I strongly advise against it. If you are not paid to tell jokes, don't do it. Yeah, That's an interesting don't point because 
a lot of the time people will say when you start a speech might not be uh, you might not be a host or an MC, oh. but when you start a speech it's always good to start with something funny is that would you say that's true i hear that quite a bit yeah. based on what i've seen over hundreds and hundreds of events and thousands of keynote speakers it bombs better know way that it's funny. <laughs> more than it's, I mean, one of the best ones I've ever heard was recently actually where a young chap from Singapore and he was so softly spoken, but it, it was his demeanor and how he delivered the message as opposed to in conjunction with what he said. And he got up and said something along the lines of, you know, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be on stage. I'm really looking forward to getting a new LinkedIn photo with me speaking on a stage or something like that. And it just the way he delivered it yeah. was just so funny. Like the audience was in hysterics, right? And so, <laughs> and that's a case where the risk is paid off because it was hilarious, right? But it was actually a really funny joke. And a lot of people do put, like it's observational humor, right? Because a lot of people have them on a stage in their sure. LinkedIn photo. So I found it hilarious and so did most of the audience. Uh, but if you're going to start with a joke, you better make sure it's going gonna, it's gonna to land. Yeah, you better make sure there's a good reward behind that or it's a ripper or you've got a strategy or you're a paid comedian or you've got a strategy to come back because if it bombs. Yeah, or you've, yeah. Got a, you've got a good line to say, oh, well, you've got a funny joke to follow up if it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. I Again, it, it all comes back to risk and reward for, for me. Yeah. Those first few moments of a keynote speech and for anyone delivering a keynote speech, they are so important. I mean, think about if you've ever seen anyone on stay, uh, on on a train, you know, going through their Insta feed, they don't stop. No. They don't stop for photos anymore. These kids just don't, people in general, they're not just kids. Mate, they are swiping the whole time. They never stop. Our attention span is so short. Yeah. And if you don't connect with your audience with something pretty impressive, and I'm not trying to scare people, right? It's possible to do an amazing speech by just getting up there and being yourself. But start with your why. Yeah. Start with a bit of energy. G'day, my name's Luke Hannon. It's really great to be here. Have you ever thought, how about this? Yep. You know, I'm working with someone at the moment that does a business that, 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 that saves people money. Right. Talk about loss aversion. Get them engaged. People hate losing things. Get them engaged early on. Another mistake I see people make is they introduce themselves. I've just gone bio introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Darren Stoll. And then he gets up there. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Darren Salt. It's like, well, I just said that. <laughs> they know who you are. The MC just said it. Your name's on the screen. Yeah, you don't need true. to introduce yourself again. <laughs> you know? I love it. And if you do feel the need to mention your name, yeah. I would suggest open strong with something. Yeah. Talk for a bit. As Luke mentioned, Darren Salt's my name. This is what I do. And we're going to go on a bit of a journey today. Because by that stage, you've got them. Yeah, that's Get great. them first and then do the housekeeping if you have to do it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Fantastic. So, I mean, over 400 events, you've spoken to a lot of people, you've been in many rooms, many different dynamics and energies. What are some of your main tips for how to grab people's attention? That's because that's the key. How do you hold people's attention? Ooh. Grabbing and holding are two different things. True. Well, let's do both. But, yeah. The first is, and speaking is a simple thing, yeah. really. It's one person communicating a message to someone or others, right? It's it's a person on this side sending a message to this person. That's what communication is in its purest form. But then there's how that person encodes their message, how they deliver it. There's the message itself. And then how's the, there's, there's the audience and they decode it. So you can say something in a particular way. And this is why email is so fraught with danger. People read your attitude and tone in an email based on their own worldviews most of the time. Yeah, that's right. So you're not calling up to say, you know, I'm really concerned about this. Let's get together and I need your help. They might read that as, oh, I'm so concerned about this with a real pessimistic view, like you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah. That's why Career Advice 101, if something ever blows up, pick up the phone or go and speak to them in person because yep. that human connection, you just can't substitute it. Now, back to your question around getting and, and maintaining attention. So speaking is, is one person communicating to another. But when you break that down, there's three core elements. There's what you're saying, the message. There's who you're saying it to, which is your audience. And then there's you, how you're saying it. Yeah. So what you're saying, who you're saying it to, and, and how you say it. Delivery, yeah. And so. Yeah, when, when we do training, we dive into those three things in detail. But once you understand 
what you want to say and who you're saying it to, then you can focus on how you're going to deliver it. And the message in the audience is just as important as how in terms of keeping their attention and, of course, getting it in the first place. And that's what we do work on, either one-on-one with clients I coach or we do these group sessions, which are really cool, where we get people from all walks of life into a, into a room for a half day's training. And there's only 30, so it's quite intimate and it's quite a safe space. And we all work on those different tools within those frameworks of speaking nice. to lift up their level of, of communication. And a lot of the magic is in delivery. Yeah. Little they things say, like what They say that uh, communication is 70 or 80% nonverbal. Mm. So it's mm. all the rest of the stuff that's important. And nonverbal, which is why the three commandments of the video call, well, there's a few, but the three I talk about are the camera at least. One, have it on. Yep. <laughs> Two, have it at eye level, which ours are. Yep. Three, look at it. Yeah, that's right. You know, there's nothing worse than having your camera off or laptops with the webcam at the top are the worst device because the camera is looking up your nose, right? Oh, that's the worst. I Bad mute for anyone. But it's so easy to fix. If you're in a Zoom meeting and it's an important meeting, put the camera on a box of tissues. Yep, exactly. Grab a garbage bin, turn it upside down, throw your lappy on that. Or put your laptop on a couple of books to raise it. Right, books, anything. Yep. Get the camera at eye level yep. and then look at it. And, and a hot tip, if you, if you can't remember to look at it, Grab a post-it note, write smile and draw an arrow <laughs> towards the camera so it reminds you to come back. I get asked the question a bit around where do I look at the camera or the screen? Now, for most of this, I'm presenting to the camera because the viewers will be watching us having a chat. Yeah. But if you're in a meeting with someone, when you're presenting, I'll stare straight down the barrel of the camera. When the other person's talking, I generally look down at them like I'm doing now because you'll be able to see I'm not looking at the camera, but I'm looking into Darren's eyes. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. The weird thing about a video call is you can't actually look someone in the eye <laughs> because when I'm looking at my camera, Darren can look at his screen and see into my eyes. Right. When Darren's looking at his camera, I can look at my screen and see into his eyes, but we can't we're look into each other's camera, eyes, right? But we're not seeing each other's eyes. We're looking at the camera. No, we're not seeing each other's eyes, right? So the simple rule I follow on that, when you're presenting or speaking, look at your camera. When you're listening, look at the person. Yeah, I like that. And then there's, there's a healthy mix, healthy mix between that. Yeah. Eye contact is another one that's really important around getting and keeping their attention. Yeah. Don't look down. Look up. Look at people. Make a key point. Look at someone make a key point and then move to the next person and then make your next point there. And then pivot to someone else. Make a point and then go to someone else. Yep. It sounds really simple. And be aware for the speakers. When you look at someone in the audience, they might look away. That's fine. Keep looking at them. Yep. Yep. But share the love. Hot tip for when you're in meetings. Again, maintaining the attention. Quite often, if a senior manager asks a question, the propensity is to pre present back to them, but you have to share the love. So make sure you look around and you might find yourself having to pivot. Like if I'm in a meeting room, assuming I'm on the side of the table and not at the head, there's going to be people to my left and people to my right. Yeah. So I'm going to make a conscious effort to sit sideways sometimes and look at the imaginary person next to me here. Then I'm going to bring it back and, and engage with the people across. And it does a few things. Not only does looking let you connect, but it also lets you see if they're confused, if the message is sinking in, you're getting some active listening, or if they're on their phones and they've glossed over. Now, if they're on their phones and glossed over, it depends, right, why they're doing that. It could be because they've got an important email. It could be because they're rude and just don't pay attention. Or it could be because you've spoken too long yeah. and it's time to make it more interesting or exciting. And if you see people unengaged, I'm just going to pause because I know that's a lot of information to digest. Would love to get your thoughts and take any questions. Yeah, great. Yeah. Simple as that. And the other thing that's always uh, that I find sometimes quite useful when I see people is they use their physical um, actions. They jump on mm. tables. They jump on chairs. They run to the other side of the stage. You know, they actually do something rather than just stay in one spot. Yeah, yeah. And walking on stage is perfect as well. Again, depending on the room. If it's a a wide stage in a wide room, as in you know, if, if the room is shaped, let's do this right. Here's a piece of paper. If the stage is there, then you're going to need to pivot almost 180 degrees to yeah. see everyone, yeah. right? But if the stage is here, yeah. well, then your pivot needs to be a bit less. Maybe that's 90 or 120 degrees, right? Yeah. And it's all these little things that you can do when you get to an event as a speaker to work out where am my audience going to be and how am I going to engage? Another pro tip, get there early and try and get up on stage. If you're presenting at a conference, and you're presenting after lunch or, or any time really, 
Get there when there's no one there before the conference starts or during a break and get up on stage. Nice. Because oh, the room will always feel a lot bigger than you think. Yeah. And especially if there's 500 sets of eyes looking at you. And it can be quite shocking. And so you don't want to get that shock when you walk onto stage to deliver your keynote because it's going to be really hard to deliver an energizing open to build engagement. So adjust to the environment before you get there. And then keep it interesting. Consider your audience. Like, why are they there? Yeah. If they're try there. And read their energy while you're there. Oh, don't just ramble on your own, uh, definitely. own content. Try and read their energy. Yeah. And if your audience is there to be inspired, then try and be inspiring. You know, if it's that kind of conference where it's a feel good, you know, inspiring keynotes, they're trying to provoke different thoughts and stuff like that. That's a very different proposition to a sponsor pitch at a financial conference, right? So don't pitch because if you pitch to them, they are gone. Yeah, yeah. Because you're presenting in a manner that's not congruent with what they're expecting to hear. You know, you're encoding your messages in a way that they're going, wait, wait a minute. I came here to have my thoughts provoked and to be inspired and maybe look differently about life. Yeah, and you're trying to sell me executive coaching. Yeah. Now I understand there's a there's a there's a there's a loose connection between executive coaching and thought provoking, but the executive coach is probably better off getting up there trying to inspire and connect with these people and build that reputation because they're going to go, man, that guy connected with me. I'm connected with him. He can help me, which is generally true, right? Right. Love it. Wow. I mean, great, great lessons. I've got a little, uh, my first one, you know, important keynote coming up in a couple of months. So I've got to take on these uh, tips from you. Oh, it'd be great to have a chat. I mean, usually... Usually we deliver our public speaking training over a half day. So trying to jam it in and tell the story of life and events and people falling through stages, uh, it does, it does, it does make it, uh, it does make it tough. Let me ask you a question. Uh, Cause again, usually I'm the questionnaire, question E, question not the question yourself, can he? Talk to me about, <laughs> so about the podcast journey. Uh, what's exciting. What excites you as a podcast host? What are you like seeing in other podcasts and, and, and maybe in your own? Yeah, well, as a podcast host, I love, honestly, I just love connecting with other people and learning, yes. hearing their story and, and not, and being the conductor in a way of the show, <laughs> but letting them take the stage. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. my personality. I'm not really yeah. one to take over the mic. It's more just <laughs> setting the stage and allowing yeah. someone else to kind of fill the void and share their story. That's what I love. Do you remember your first? I do. I do. I, when I first started... I used to do them live and I had a, a friend of mine that's a videographer and yeah. then COVID hit yeah. and then that changed all that. And then it became on Zoom and I've just kept that format because it works really well. And I can yeah. talk to people all over the world. Yeah, that's 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 the interesting thing about virtual. It's got its pros and its cons. Yeah. One of them is that that geographical, the geographical plus in that you can you can be speaking to anyone from anywhere. It, 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 while they are anywhere, I mean, they could be sitting in their car at the beach in in in, in Rio de Janeiro, right? It doesn't matter as long as they've got internet. Yeah. Uh, Any time of the day. And, <laughs> and and they don't they don't mind a chat. What about life lessons? And I'll share a few of mine. I'll, I'll get yours first. But you know, things you wish you knew when you were younger, because I think that's always fascinating for people to to learn uh, from others. And I'm, I'm in my forties, so I like to share a bit of it. The the best one for me is that I suppose this is a bit of a. Um, a contradiction because you can't really do anything about it. But when you're younger, you think you know everything. <laughs> and as you get older, you realize the value and the wisdom that comes with experience. But if yeah. you tell that to your younger self, your younger self won't believe you. So it's yeah. one of those things. But when you come down, when you when you go further through life, you really realize how much you didn't know when you were younger and how much you still don't know compared to how you're gonna know how much you're gonna know in the next 10, 20 years. So it's yeah. fascinating. It there's a big one on that and there's two one of mine's quite connected to that the first is mum's always right yep my mum maureen <laughs> god love her she was yeah. always right and as the young i hesitate to word to use to, to use the word arrogant but let's face it i think i'd gone beyond the threshold of confidence and i think any any teenage boy is to a certain extent That's arrogant where they think they know it all uh, and, and they've arrived, and I don't think we ever do. But mum was always right, so that's the first one. Uh, but again, you can't tell your younger self that because they would just brush it off. The second one is kind of what you've said, but a different view or through a different lens. Because quite often when we're young, we become so self-conscious about 
what others think and whether we're being judged and maybe we're not good enough. And so the advice I would give my younger self and give younger kids as well is, mate, don't worry about it. No one else has a clue either. That's right. Just get out there and have a go. Because quite often we look around and we think everyone else is an expert. Like people see me on stage and to be fair, I'm probably an above average speaker. Am I the best speaker in history? No, but I can hold my own. And they think they can't do that. But there was a time when it was my first event, when I took the conference stage for the first time, mate, and I had a go. I still put the prep work in. I didn't wing it. But I look back at Luke Hannon from 2018 and Luke Hannon from now, I'm the same person. Yep. I've just got more runs on the board. I think, and you know, you're going to go on that journey. That's part of the process. You yes, have to, you have to just embrace that journey. Yeah, and back to your earlier question around why use an MC in the movie Captain Phillips, and I love this comment. And Stephen Covey says it in his book as well, Seven Habits. Uh, Captain Phillips says, throughout my life, I'd been making small little deposits into the experience bank. I see it. And then one day clearly when he had double engine failure through bird strikes, I had to make a significant withdrawal from that yep. and I had enough funds to cover it. Love it. Love it. Love it. And I think, well, I truly believe as an MC, as a professional MC, back to your question as to why I use one, most good MCs have been making little deposits exactly. into that experience bank so that if and when something goes wrong, they've got enough credit to cover it. They've got the balance to cover it. I love that. And of course, in a perfect world, when nothing goes wrong, you still miss the value of the MC knowing how to set the room up and stuff like that. Yep. But when something goes wrong, they're overdrawn. Yep. And so it's funny you touched upon that because I, I, I love that. But life is a journey. And, and when I coach, my two key takeaways, one we've spoken about, speaking is simply one person speaking to another. It's, it's that easy. The second thing is speaking and life in general. Life is a journey. And that's why I like, you know, what's your first podcast and how are you now? Number 204. You're always going to get better. You're going to yes. fail. My daughter plays pretty competitive tennis, right? She did the coin toss, and I'm such a proud dad. I tell everyone this, so you're in for a treat, and you're going to get told as well. Scarlett did the coin toss at the, at the 2023 Australian Open Women's Final. So Rod Laver Arena, 15,000 people, and there's our little daughter <laughs> throwing the coin. It was oh, amazing. Yeah, sensational. But Scarlett plays quite competitive tennis. You don't win every point. You know, Scarlett used to get unhappy about her first serves not going in. I pulled up some stats. I said, how, how many times do you think Roger Federer hits a fault? She's like, oh, I don't know, you know, never. 66% of Roger's first serves go in, give or take. I mean, you can look at the statistic. I think it's about two thirds, wow. which means one out of every three serves he hits yep. is a fault. And this is arguably the greatest player of all time. There you go. So don't let it get to you. Every time you do something, every time you make a mistake on the tennis court, in a business meeting, in love, in life, you fall off your bike, you crash your car. There's inherent lessons in that. And there's a great quote. And sorry, I'm a bit of a quote and a bookie, but there's a great quote by Vince Lombardi. So the NFL trophy they play for in the Super Bowl is called the Lombardi Trophy. He's like the greatest NFL coach ever. And when I was younger, this quote really helped to shape me. And it was errors and mistakes are necessary in life. But once you once you learn from the error, forget it. Yeah. What you did wrong doesn't, doesn't matter. That's what right. you need to take forward from is the baggage of the Mate, take forward the lesson. Because that helps you on your journey, right? That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's yeah. you know, one of the best ways to learn is by making mistakes. You know, absolutely. Hardcore, right? Hardcore. Now, make sure you also learn from your successes as well, right? Like, I'm a huge Formula One fan, and I guarantee you, the way those teams are debriefing is just as intense after a win as it is after a yep. bad loss or a bad crash, because you need to understand what happened. Yeah. You know, your company's just done something, or you you asked a girl out and she said no. Have a think about it. Introspect. Yeah. How were you dressed? Did you know her? You know what I mean? What does she think about you? Did you build a relationship before you just went for that? I mean, that's a weird example, right? But you, you failed to get an approval. You failed to get a sale. That's okay. You're going to get heaps of no's. That's right. But why? And try and take accountability for that no. You know, when I'm, when I'm training people and presenting, take accountability for your actions. It's really easy, excuse me, to blame other people for something that's gone wrong. Absolutely, it's easy. But there's always something you could have done more. And if you've got the, how do we say it, maturity, and I didn't, like I'm 42 and I'm still a baby, but I like to think I can, I can reflect a little bit. But if you've got the maturity and the humbleness to look back and go, yep. you know what, My, you know, people turned up late, half the people didn't show up, 
all these things went wrong, but maybe I could have done this better. Maybe I should have double. What confirmed. did I do well, and what what can yes. I improve on? You know, absolutely. And I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in self critiquing. Like I critique mm. everything I do, whether it worked out or it didn't work out. I critique it, yeah. I reflect on it, and you learn from it for sure. Yeah, try not to beat yourself up too hard. Like I have a bad habit of leaving events, perhaps when I was younger, but still now. And I could host the most amazing conference and you bring the audience on a journey. The crowd goes wild. The feedback is amazing. But I did something weird that no one noticed, but I'm smashing myself about this. Yeah. And it could have been something trivial. I've like totally forgotten about it. Yep. Mate, half the people probably didn't even notice it, right? Yeah, exactly. But something happened and I'm that self-critical. And that's not a bad thing, but the message in there is don't beat yourself up too hard. Like if you find your self-talk as in the way you talk to yourself, which for most of us it is, because the way we talk to ourselves, we would never accept that from anyone else, right? Yeah. <laughs> but we beat ourselves up so hard. So, uh, yeah, give yourself a break. Uh, no one else has a clue either, right? Like, <laughs> you're on the journey, mate. Life's a journey. Well, mate, um, before we move on, I just want to give everybody the opportunity to get in contact with you. So tell us a bit more about how we can find you and, and how you work just in, you know, in general. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, most of the work I do is through through referral. The speaking training program I spoke about, I'm probably going to start to do a bit of above, above the line advertising or working my networks. But if you check out lukehannon.com.au, and I'm sure we can throw the the website on the page or in the link somewhere in the description, uh, lukehannon.com.au, my number's there, my email's there. And like I said before, pick up the phone. Give me a call or send me an SMS because clearly I'm at, if I'm at a conference, it's hard to pick up the phone. But there is downtime where I can fire back a quick message and I'd be delighted to speak to anyone who's A, looking for an MC who's got a bit of excitement, B, wants to learn about you know hosting their mate's wedding, C, wants to become a better public speaker, or D, just wants to have a yarn. I'm always, I'm always up for a chat you about life. coaching and training and, and, and in that respect as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're putting together a really cool program of training because sometimes you know Westpac or a large company will call me in to do a half-day training. But a small business who's got one or two people, that's a very different value prop. Yeah. So for them, we've got you know that bespoke, intimate, maybe a couple of dozen people. I'm doing them in Parramatta in Sydney's West, in the Sydney CBD. I'm going to travel down to Melbourne because I spent a bit of time there doing it and probably up in Brisbane as well right. uh, or wherever, wherever it takes me. But give me a call. We'd love to have a chat. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. Uh, and that's when someone says, hey, Luke, I've got, you know, I want to get better at this. I've got a very specific need. Yeah. And then we sit back and just, do lots of listening and, and and critique them and help them on their journey. So lukehannon.com.au, my digits are on there in terms of phone number and email. Drop me a, a note. would be delighted to uh, to have a chat. Beautiful. Well, Luke, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. You're full of energy. You're full of great wisdom. You know, you're very entertaining and insightful to talk to, um, even though I've done most of the listening, but that's, you know, <laughs> it's been great. <laughs> Any conversation. As I would, as I would expect. Um, <laughs> but um, I'd love to leave you with the last um couple of words. So anything else would you like to leave us with? Oh, you know, back to the 2012 Citibank story where I realized I didn't want to be a CEO. Without getting too philosophical, life is short, right? Life is short. Um, there's a great book by Neil deGrasse Tyson, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry. <laughs> the world has been around for billions of years and, and our time on this earth, on this in, in this country, in this space is so finite. So make the most of it. Like whatever you do, yeah. be amazing. Do your best. And if that's not good enough, debrief, feedback and get better because it's really not a dress rehearsal. Again, I know that's a bit of a cliche, yeah. but I truly believe in making the most of the opportunity that you've got because before you know it, the sun's going to set and uh, and it's going to be all over. That's so really get out point. there, like have to, some yeah, fun. That's a really good point. And to even yeah. kind of extrapolate that even further, it's, be the best version of yourself you can be. Yeah. You don't have to be the best at anything, but be the best. Yeah. Reach your potential. Be the best you can be at it. And that's yeah, that's and the journey that you'll love. Mate, and that's it. And it's like who, who you were up to this point in time watching this podcast, yeah. that's your history. That's what brought you to here. But where you go from here, yeah. mate, that is totally up to you. You can go wherever you want. If you're prepared to put the work in, Nothing can stop you, right? And so to your point, Darren, be the best version of yourself. But that's not a that's not a finite position. 
That's the best version at that point in time. That's you can right. evolve and get better or take a different direction, right? I was in banking for 17 years and then pursued a career as a professional MC. You might want to become a florist or a drawer or a podcaster. <laughs> Just have a go. Yep, have a go. Yeah, man. Get out well, Luke, really had a lovely chat, man. I really uh, enjoyed that so much. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, I'm going to put all the links and everything in the show notes so you can Perfect. find Luke and definitely have a chat to him if you want to either get some coaching or check out some of his programs or get him to host your next event. I can, uh, I'm sure he's going to be fantastic. So uh, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Luke, I hope you enjoyed that as well. Mate, it was a blast. Mate, absolute pleasure. And uh, thank you again. And everyone have a fantastic day and we'll see you very, very soon for another episode of Playing With Perspective, the Suspended Animation Podcast. Bye for now. Thanks, Luke. Thank you. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Playing With Perspective, the Suspended Animation Podcast. If you would like to join me as a guest on the show, I would be delighted to collaborate feel free to buzz me on 0414-659-800 or email me on darren at suspendedanimation.com.au. I'm always on the lookout for great guests who can share their stories and expertise with my community. Also, if you have been thinking about putting your own podcast together and not sure where to begin, look no further. I run a really simple three-part podcasting course, one-on-one -on -one with me, where I walk you through the entire podcasting journey. You will end up with a fantastic new podcast to start sharing right away. Feel free to get in touch to discuss further. But for now, though, have a fantastic day and I'll see you next time.